thank you everyone for joining us. So I'm delighted that we have Professor Meryl Moore Collier with us this evening, who um, is from the Royal Agricultural University, where she is the graduate dean. And Meryl has a particular a research interest in feeding and also respiratory disease. And so tonight we have a presentation on feeding and funky fibre, why forage is the way forward for stabled horses. So um, if you have any questions that come up during the lecture, please pop them into the Q&A and um, we'll answer those at the end. So over to you, Meryl. Thank you. OK, thank you, Charlotte. <clears throat> well, good evening, everybody. And um, as Charlotte says, I do have a particular interest in, um, in feeding fibre. And in fact, I did my PhD up at the Royal Dick School in, in Edinburgh on fibre feeds. And so this has been sort of a 25 year odyssey for me to actually um, look at how, how horses um, digest or uh, um, fibre and indeed the, the, all the physiology aspects of fibre. So um, the reason that I'm into fibres in, in such a, um, a big way is because we have got a lot of current dietary challenges that occur as a result of not basically feeding enough fibre. And one of the problems that we have is that um, across the industry, we're getting better at it, but across the industry, we consider the cereal part of the diet is where the horse gets its nutrients. And we meal feed these cereals because we feed horses like we like to eat ourselves. And then we give them forage, which is sort of on the side. And that is something that we think about that horses should be eating. Most of us know now that, that with regard to time budgets, horses should be eating for probably a minimum of, of 16 hours in, in, out of 24. So we want to give them something to do in the stable. So we give them forage uh, on the side, but we don't get our forage analyzed and we don't think of the forage as um, a, a valuable nutrient source. And this is what part of my work is, is looking at all the time is to, is to readdress that and actually make people think that forage is a valuable part of the ration. The other reason that this has become particularly pertinent nowadays is that we have got a rising incidence of obesity in horses. And a recent study that my PhD student, Mark Ebert and myself did over the, over the last four years, he was looking at energy requirements. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on in the talk, but he was looking at energy requirements of performance horses. Now these performance horses were in Olympic disciplines. So they were dressage horses, show jumping horses and event horses, all fit and some of them quite high level um, horses that belonged to professionals. So these weren't the happy hackers. And of the group of horses that he looked at, he looked at measured 60 horses over a nine month period, 12 to 16% of these horses would have been classed as obese. Now I thought that was quite shocking because these are fit athletes. These are, these are, are horses that people are trying to compete or, or are competing, not just trying to compete. And we're not the only ones that have found this. Previous studies have found this where the, um, the, in the background population of general horses is 21% obese and 41% are regarded as overweight. Now that was considering all horses. So we didn't expect to find such high levels in these competition horses, but indeed we did. So a part of that is comes from feeding too much, feeding too much rich food, too many too nutrient dense diets to horses that aren't actually working that hard. Why do we do this? Well, this is because of tradition and it's also because of anthropomorphism. It's the reason why we over rug our horses as well. We go outside, we think it's cold, so we put another rug on the horse. The horse doesn't actually find it cold at all because he's got a different thermoneutral zone to ourselves. But we do what our fathers have done and our grandfathers have done. The horse industry is very traditional. And what I want to do is try and open people's minds and change the way they think about feeding horses so that we can overcome obesity and not suffer from all the other conditions that horses get as a result, result of poor feeding. The other thing that we're inclined to do because we ride them and we compete them is that we and, and we ask our vets to be very fixated on movement and disease. Disease, of course, is very important. We don't want disease in our herd, but 
we are over fixated on movement and disease and behavior, and we don't think enough about nutrition. Now, good nutrition can help counter any problems that can come with any of these three conditions. So I'm not saying that nutrition will improve all of this, but good nutrition can form good bones and good musculature so that the horses are less likely to get injured. If you've got a good gut, you've got a good good um, uh, immune response, you're less likely to get diseases. If you've got a good gut, you're less likely to come up with behavioral issues. And so we need to think about nutrition in, uh, as, as one of the first priorities and not something that we just, oh yes, gosh, you've got to go and feed the horse. When we do have problems, then what do we do? We go to the, the feed store and we find a supplement and hope that that's going to cure the problem instead of going back and looking and readdressing the diet. So one of the first things that we need to do when we're feeding, the first consideration is we've got to meet the animal's nutrient requirements. And if you do that, then the result is happiness. So whether we've got a racehorse, which is going to be um, uh, carrying less weight uh, because he needs to be light to be able to gallop, that is the ideal body condition for this particular animal. This one is quite another matter. This is actually, this horse is called Moonflash, and he is the champion um, quarter horse in Mexico. Um, and he holds the world record for running 400 yards. And he does that in 20.2 seconds. But just look at him. He is overweight. Now, I know that quarter horses do hold lots more muscle and they do look a little bit more, uh, more bulky in terms of muscle. But look at that apple bottom. That horse is significantly overweight. And not surprisingly, many of these quarter horses in Mexico come down with laminitis. And when they showed me this picture, I said, said to them, please, can I feed him for six months? And I promise you, I'll knock another two seconds off his, off his world record because he's carrying too much weight. So whether it's for long, longer distance galloping or um, short distance real, real power, or whether it actually, whatever type of energy, whether it's actually a dressage horse who's doing more long-term work, um, we have to know that what that animal requires and to feed it for that particular work. The other thing that I'm always concerned about is this resistance to disease. So we don't want to, our diets to be inducing any problems with our horses. I said just a minute ago that if you've got a good healthy gut, you, are, you have a, got a healthy immune system. And that's because 70% of the immunity, the innate immunity is held in the um, gastric associated lymphoid tissue. So if you've got a healthy microbes and healthy gut, then you've got a, a, a good chance or a better chance I should say, of being able to combat disease. But if our, our diets are not right, we can induce colic in horses. We can certainly induce laminitis, and laminitis is definitely a condition due to poor feeding. So um, the, of course, there's other conditions that are, um, on hard ground and retained placentas, et cetera, but more of our laminitis cases are down to poor feeding. We also get developmental orthopedic diseases in our young foals because we feed them too much concentrates because we want to push their growth. And the last thing, which I would consider out of all of these least important, but is often the thing that owners consider first of all is because you don't want to be bucked off because that hurts, is the excitability aspect. So if you're feeding high levels of cereals, you're getting these glucose peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs, and the horse, I mean, it comes out of the stable having been locked in the stable and fed concentrates. And then he says, well, hey, I feel great. I'm going to buck you off. Now, that would, would happen less, I'm not saying it wouldn't happen at all, but it would happen less if you were to able to reduce the cereal basis um, concentrate feeds. The other thing that we need to consider when we're feeding our horses is to improve the time budgets. So we want to feed our horses when they're in the stable in as close a way as we can to their natural diet. Because if we reduce the stress and allow them to indulge in natural foraging behavior, they're less likely to develop stereotypic behaviors. Now, stereotypic behaviors, the jury is out a little bit, and I'm sure Andrew mentioned those previously, is um, they, there, there is some link with, with perhaps some, some um, gastric pathology, uh, et cetera, but 
the main thing for me about stereotypic behavior, it's a strong indication that the horse is finding that environment highly stressful. And so he's not happy in that environment. And therefore you need to do something about it. If stereotypic behaviors are developing, your horse is under stress and that will have knock on effects for all sorts of things. So we need to think about how we feed our forage to improve time budgets. Uh, ideally, you feed the horse hay loose off the ground because that is his natural way. But if you've got a horse like my dressage horse, boy, he couldn't half ship hay in no time at all. So we had to find a way of slowing down the intake rate so that you can extend the time um, that he's eating while, without giving him too much hay so that he gets fat or too many nutrients. So the classic way is to put it in a hay net, not terribly keen on hay nets because I'm, I'm very aware of the dust that gets spread around, but also because of the pulling action of the uh, on hay nets and um, it pulls on, on the, the neck and the back, but also dentists will tell you that that's not very good for the teeth either. So we have a range of these types of um, slow feeders now out on the market. This happens to be one that's made by Haygain. And, um, this is, it involves a horse eating through a grid so that he has to work quite hard to actually nibble and, and get and get the, the hay out of the, out of the container. Um, he's also eating at a natural angle. So his head is down and he's pulling up and, and pulling to the side the way they would graze. So there's lots of things that we can do to improve the time budgets of horses. But one of the things that I think is most important, which I say to you about well, while we say, right, we need to meet nutrient demands, we need to keep the disease aspect down, and we need to make sure that the horse is eating the way it should. Now, what, 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 how do we get those nutrients into the horse? And one of the things that we must consider is the digestive anatomy. We need to pay attention to what the gut looks like and what the gut does. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here about each, each um, uh, uh aspect of digestion in the stomach and the small intestine. But this is on here just to give you um, or remind you of what proportion of the gut is the large intestine. Look how much bigger and how much a greater lion's share of the gut that that is. And therefore, this is the bit that you should be feeding. This is the bit that you should be looking after. And that is where the forage goes. That is where the forage is processed within the horse. So, probably because I spent too many years trying to drop, ride dressage, I think of things in patterns. And so I think of the horse's gut as a, as a sideways triangle. And that's quite useful because it does emphasize what size of the gut, what aspect of the gut we need to be looking at. So within this triangular configuration, if you like, we need to ensure that our horses have been fed round about two and a half to three percent of their body weight per day. That's the gut capacity. That's how much they, they need to eat. Some will eat a little bit more, some a little bit less, but that's, we work it out generally on two and a half percent and then and, and gauge it up, up or down a little bit depending on what the horse is, is doing. But of that, an absolute minimum to maintain gut health has got to be 1.5%. So you should be feeding over half of your diet as fiber. Now, I can, that doesn't mean hay necessarily. There's um, the, the other fibers we'll talk about, but that is, is what we should be doing. And every horse should be getting that because that's what maintains gut health. And that fiber is digested by all these microorganisms. So we've got protozoa, we've got fungi, we've got bacteria, we've got yeasts, and they need to be kept healthy. So they need to be kept active, and diverse. And the more fiber you feed, research has shown this time and time again, that the healthier the microbiome is. So the more diverse and the more stable that core is. And all of that actually makes for a healthier horse. So within that, then we're thinking of, right, okay, I said we would need to match energy requirements. So what are the energy requirements of horses? And why do we end up feeding them too much? Well, this work that, that Mark Ebert did, he took 60 sport horses from 30 in the UK and 30 in, in Switzerland, and he measured their energy expenditure by measuring their, um, their heart rate. So they had heart rate monitors on them, and he measured it second by second. 
and there were a, a, a thousand measurements, over a thousand measurements per horse. And that's just the equation if anybody's interested in it. But what he was looking at was how much energy actually do horses require for maintenance and how much do they require for work? And interestingly, out of all of these horses, he found that this was the equation he, had, he derived, but he found that from two to 20% greater um, requirements for maintenance than, with, than have been to date recommended by the official um, bodies of the United States, France, Germany, and Holland. So basically horses need a little bit more than the recommendations to maintain them in what we call zero weight gain, so in, in energy balance, so that they maintain that level. Now it's quite important to know that because actually over the season, it is very difficult when animals are traveling and competing to actually keep a steady state. Every horse has got an ideal competition weight and we need to be aware of what that is and to be able to find ways of maintaining that. But then when he decided to look at, at the energy levels, uh, so this the energy expenditure for exercise, this is the equation here, the multiples of maintenance were much lower than actually the official recommendations. So in fact, the maintenance still makes up the lion's share of the diet. And even for these horses working quite hard, they only required 15% more that of, the, of what they're being fed for maintenance. And so this means that the official guidance for horses working was anything between 111% to 15% over what horses needed. So that suggests that we overestimate the energy requirement of work. So when we take our horses out, and even if we work them for an hour or so, um, even if they're cantering, doing quite a lot of cantering, fit event horses, et cetera, they still do not have that, that um, one and a half to two times the maintenance requirements that for, for uh, performing that work. And this is why people end up feeding cereals because they think they need to get more energy into a horse when it's working and they think they need to feed it more and gradually what happens is that that the, the body weight increases and increases and increases and unless you do some condition scoring and actually do an objective assessment you don't notice that happening so it's very important to look at this and think about how much energy your horse actually requires so what this means is that when you're wanting to match the requirements with the demand then um, most horses actually only require low energy diets. They do not require lots of concentrates. And therefore, an all fiber diet, and you can be imaginative about the way in which we, we feed fibers, but an all fiber diet can actually meet requirements. So what are the benefits of fiber? Fiber are slow, is slow release. It's digest, it's fermented, I should say, in the, in the hindgut. And so it re releases volatile fatty acids, so you don't get the glucose peaks and troughs. So it's constant slow release energy. Many fibers, the, the more um, uh, what I call bucket fiber feeds, some of them can actually have quite high energy contents. They can be up to 10 megajoules of, of digestible energy per um, kilogram dry matter. So they can eat equal some of the, the um, uh, cool mixes. We definitely, as I've said before, have lower incidence of colic and all fiber diets because of the microbial population, but it's a good reservoir for water. So some of the fibers, the, the hemicellulose and the pectin content of the fibers actually holds water, and that can then be released for, for cooling purposes when the animal is working. But also, fiber actually increases the time to fatigue from electrolyte loss. So we do find that horses that um, are losing lots of electrolytes, that actually, if you have good high levels of fiber, not only is the electrolyte content of the diet higher, but actually the animal can go for longer before they start to suffer from electrolyte loss because it's slow release energy and it's a better profile. Uh, some of the bucket fiber feeds there that I've just, just mentioned now, um, these are what I would refer to more as we're sort of going towards the, fun the funky fiber now. And we all like to, I do, 
I like to feed my horse something in the bucket because you just like to feel you're feeding them. It's part of catching them. It's all it's all part of, of your relationship with the horse, but it doesn't have to be cereals. And so one of the first things that you can do is you can feed grass pellet pellets. The grass pellets are palatable, they're highly nutritious, they're energy dense feed, etc. Always palatable, a fibre feed though. Lots of energy, good protein levels, a fibre feed. And then you've got these whole range of other fibres. We've got alfalfa, which is, is um, chopped lucerne. We've got super molly chop, which is, <coughs> um, is chopped straw and, um, and sugar beet pulp. <coughs> Excuse me. We've got high fibre cubes, which are a mix of soya hulls and sugar beet and other fibres. And then we've got sugar beet pulp itself. Now, all of these are what I would call super, uh, super fibres. And they can be fed in the bucket, but they are all fibre feeds. They still go to the hindgut. There's a proportion of them for something like sugar beet pulp, for instance. We get 14% of the fibre proportion of that is digested in the small intestine. Um, so it's, it's a very useful feed from that point of view. That's where it releases its calcium. But um, on the whole, they go through to the hindgut and they help to uh, stimulate a healthy microbial population so that animals can grow good, healthy microbes and have a healthy hindgut. Uh, taking things a little step further then, this is, this is where we sort of got into funky fiber because um, I was approached by the company Eclipse who actually make what they call carvage, which is very high quality chopped um, uh, haylage for, for calves. And they wanted to get into horse feed. So they approached me and asked me, could I make some feeds for them, or formulate some feeds for them based on this haylage? So with all of that in mind and the gut health and, and um, building up nice, um, healthy joints and not having foals um, being crazy, we decided that we would make a total mixed fiber ration for thoroughbred foals. So that's what the TMFR is. And it, we, so we compiled this and here are the foals eating this and it's an all fiber diet. There's a little bit of soybean meal in there to, to, to um, have small intestine digestible um, protein, but the rest of it, a little bit of fat, a little bit of yeast, but on the whole, it's just, it's basic haylage. There's no cereals, no starch in there at all. And we wanted to know, A, would foals eat this and how would they grow on it? So after preliminary trials back in 2016, and we saw we'd got good, good growth rates and the foals loved it, we then did a matched pairs trial where we fed four of them this um, just total mixed ration, and they were fed it at a rate of 10 kilo, um, kilograms um, per head per day, or cereals at six kilograms per head per day. Now that is a staggeringly, shockingly high level of cereals to be fed to these foals. But these foals were being prepped for the foal sales. And so um, they were being pushed. They really were being pushed. And then we measured average daily gain and height and girth. And we also had behavioral observations. Now, apologies, this is a slightly busy slide, but this just tells you a little bit of everything that we found. The, 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 um, uh, the graph here on the top right hand side just shows you the growth trajectories, the one in, in the orange were the, um, the concentrate fed and the ones in the green were the fiber fed. Now these, these group, they were matched pairs for, both, for full um, birth dates, so they were on the same growth trajectory, but these were from different stallions. So they, this group were all together slightly lighter because they were, just, they were just born smaller. But the most important thing about this is that they all followed exactly the same growth trajectory. So there was no significant difference in the average daily gain that these foals made throughout the, the period of being fed. But the other thing that we did as well is we measured quality growth aspects. So this is looking at wither height and hip height because we want, I'm very aware that people will say, well, if you feed foals lots of fiber, they get pot bellies. And that is not actually the case on this. And we found that we had very close and very good quality growth. So they put on real bone and height and um, good quality growth. But running alongside that, what we did as well is we took the feces and we ran what we call a gas production experiment to look at the lactate profiles of these different feeds. And the green line here is the, the total mixed fiber ration and the orange line is the concentrate ration. 
And you can see within the, these bottles, which are mimicking the, the, the gut um, fermentation chamber, much, much higher levels of lactic acid. And it, they only came down to the, um, to the TMFR level when, when we got to about sort of 58 um, hours or so. So basically, while it is functionally in the worst, which is up to, up to about this sort of time here, um, the lactate levels are continually higher when you feed cereals. And that means that the horse's gut is a bit acidic. And this is why we get disturbance or perturbations in the gut in terms of, of microbial population. So having done this work then, I was approached by the, um, by the company to actually produce something for performance horses. So I produced then a formulated what they call a healthy horse fiber mixed ration. And it's basically a highly, high, um, highly digestible fiber for competition horses. Again, it has no cereals in it at all. It's high in oil because of the extra energy that might be needed. Natural diet alleviates ulcers, very similar profile to cereals. Um, and, to the, and I formulated this that is quite high in energy so that it can be used to replace some or all of the cereal. And so we had a, a little case study here that went on in Ireland. This is a show jumping horse who's at one, one uh, meter fi uh, five, one meter 50. And, and he um, was a very promising dress um, show jumping horse, but he was started to have behavioral problems. He wouldn't jump, he was napping. And so his, the owner cut his feet right back. And as you can see from this picture here, the horse lost a lot of body condition, lost a lot of muscle. And then they heard about the, the um, fiber ration. So they put the horse in the fiber ration and within three months, this is what the horse looks like now. Now we're not gonna watch the whole video, but just to give you an example, well, A, look at the backside on, on the horse now. And this is the same jockey that was having all the problems with the horse. And the only thing that they have done here is to actually uh, change the diet. So they cut cereals out of the diet completely. And they fed at the TMFR and started to hack him out, etc. And you can just see now how calmly and how well he's jumping. Um, so this, it certainly did. Um, and look at the body condition as well. It certainly did work, work for this horse, okay? Um, so those, that's looking at the funky fiber and the bucket fiber side of things. We do of course need to be feeding um, long fiber and, um, and hay and haylage um, in the stable. Um, grass, of course, is the first nourishment for horses. Um, grass has had a very bad press over the last number of years because of the, the fructan story and the induction of laminitis. Um, grass is a very good feed, provided you feed the right sort of grass. And this really isn't. This is rye grass. This is grass that was bred for dairy pastures and for, for growing beef. So we need to be very aware of the type of grass that we are feeding our horses. Grass is very good, but not the sort that um, you know, the, the very lush and high sugar grasses. Looking at haze, then we do need to be, it can contribute to this minimum of 1.5% of the body weight per day, but hay can be very bulky. So we need to be aware of that. So thinking about replacing some of the hay with these more bucket fiber feeds. Um, but sometimes for horses that are overweight, the fact that it's bulky and it's low in energy can be a good thing because actually we don't want our horses, we want them to be eating for long periods of time, but we don't want them to be getting too fat. In other cases, it's not quite so good because we may want more nutrients. So this is a matter then of choosing your forage carefully and just thinking a lot more about the forage aspect of the diet because we do lose quite a lot of energy from forage and heat increment. So in the summertime, when the animal is working and the environment is hot, that is not so good. But um, at other times, it's good. It's, it's like central heating for a horse in the wintertime. But the other thing, of course, then that I'm always interested in and aware of is that the particularly hay is actually dusty. So we, uh, when you're choosing your, your type of long fiber, you need to look at, look at the types that we have um, available. So you've got you know, different haylages, seed haze, meadow haze, lucerne haze. And essentially, it's a matter of looking at the nutrient profile and also looking at the dust profile and choosing the right fiber for you. And this is why it's important to actually get your forage analyzed so that you can have this data and you know what it is that, that um, you want to feed your horse. 
Uh, a lot of times people treat hay before feeding, and I just want to, I'm, I know I'm running short of time, but just want to have a quick mention about this because many people will, because of the wear of the dust, will soak hay before feeding. But soaking leaches nutrients, leaches valuable minerals, and, um, and leaches water-soluble carbohydrates. So for some horses, that's not a good thing to do. But the most worrying thing about soaking is that it does increase the bacteria content of the hay. Um, it also produces th this horrible high biologically oxygen demand post liquor, so it shouldn't be put down storm drains. But the one positive that you can get from this is that if you soak, you lose water soluble carbohydrates. So for horses that have got laminitis, that can be a way of getting over the water soluble carbohydrate content. However, you still will get you still lose the nutria, the minerals, and you still get an increase in bacteria. So it's not something that I actually recommend people to do. The other thing, because we're very good at doing DIY here in the UK, people have um, learned now that steaming hay can be very effective, so they make their own steamers. The trouble with these steamers is they don't do the job properly, and basically what you're doing is creating a little incubator for bacteria. So it, because it, it doesn't steam um, at high enough temperature for long enough, and not all the hay gets steamed. And so basically you just, when you put in heat and dampness, bacteria multiply hugely. So you can actually get, you do get slight reduction in respirable particles in the wet part of the hay, but, the, but you do get massive increases in bacteria. So it's not a, not a process I would recommend. If you need to treat your hay before, then you have to do something like this. You have to get a proper specialized high temperature steamer that injects steam and you get complete steaming of the hay so that you reduce the dust and you actually kill all the bacteria that's in the hay. And this is just, um, just the, the um, data that just supports some of that studies in that soaking is, is effective at getting rid of the um, dust, but it does do all the other negative things. Whereas when you steam, work properly steam, you um, get rid of the dust and you don't have the negative aspects. And the bins and the kettles, they do get rid of a little bit of dust, but you still also have the other negative aspects. So it's just as well to be aware of that. And, and this is just looking at the mold and the bacteria so that just supports what I've said. So high temperature steaming, you will get a reduction of 95% in respirable particles. You kill the bacteria. The horses find it very palatable and actually it stays clean for a long time. So um, you do get some variable loss of water soluble carbohydrates, but on the whole, you don't lose as much in, in steaming as you do in soaking. So that might be a benefit for horses that need the WSC, but perhaps not quite so much for horses that are um, nominitic. So, um, so just things to continually review now while you're going through your, um, what you're feeding your horse. Look at the body weight, monitor the horse's weight and think about is it slightly creeping up or indeed is the animal losing body condition? So do lay your hands on the horse and objectively think about it. Don't just stand at that stable and look over the door. Think about the work level. Unless your animal is working very hard, unless he's going three day eventing, that animal is in light work and you really do not need to feed that much. Think about your housing and daily routines so that you actually think about how you can um, get these nice fibers into the diet and how you can improve the horse's environment so that you extend that eating time and you reduce the stress level. Think about the partial or indeed the complete replacement of starchy cereals with highly digestible fibers. There are ways in which you can do this. There's lots of feed out in the market now, and you just need to be a bit imaginative and search around and find out what it is that you can replace your, your cereal feeds with. Um, better monitoring is, is the key. Every horse is an individual, so look at them individually and think about how you can improve that horse's gut health and welfare by feeding fiber. So I'd just like to thank or acknowledge my colleagues, Simon Daniels and Suko Martin, who have helped with lots of this work. And we've had many postgraduate students who've spent hours either um, counting particles or growing bacteria or counting the number of chews, et cetera, um, for horses looking at all of these different systems. And to thank the sponsors, Eclipse Feeds and Bucklands Farm Stud and Haygain for um, sponsoring this work over the last 10 years. 
and thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Mariel. That was really interesting and very much thought provoking presentation. So thank you. Um, so do we have any questions from the audience? So I, I have a question, which is um, with the Eclipse fiber feed, I think you were suggesting that different horses might require a different quantity based on their work and individual requirements. So how do you then account for sort of micronutrients and protein in the total mix ration? Well, the, or is that the, separate? Um, no, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it was formulated so that it was very similar to a, a racehorse mix. So if, for example, somebody's feeding, you know, four kilos of racehorse mix, what they can do is they can take out um, two kilos and put in the TM TMFR, and actually you've got a very similar sort of energy and protein level, et cetera. With the micronutrients, you will inevitably have a different and actually a better profile with the fiber feeds because it's more vegetative state of growth. And certainly with things like the important minerals, things like calcium and magnesium um, and zinc and copper, they are all higher in this feed than they are in, in cereal feeds. And they are also more available because of just the way they're held within, within the plant and where they're, where they're degraded in the gut. So um, uh, certainly with energy and protein, you, you, um, as it's been formulated to be that, that replacement. Yes, thank you. And, um, and I think there is a, I mean, there's a bit of a lag, but there does seem to be, I mean, this is a real challenge, as you say, to convention, but I think people are starting to take this on board, aren't they? Like obviously feed companies are, and I think a lot of clients that I would see are, are shifting. And I, I would say that probably gastric ulcers is the main drive, I think, for people to take this approach rather than just general health and weight control would be my experience. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think you're right. And certainly over the last 10 years, I have seen a shift. I've, I've definitely seen a shift. And, um, but I still do see people feeding cereals where I really don't think they need to. And, yes. um, and so I, I think I would like to, and we do see quite a lot of stereotypic behaviours. We probably see horses stable more than they ever used to be. And we do see quite a lot of gastric ulcers. Now, it's, it's interesting. My colleague Simon Daniels and I think that probably horses just have gastric ulcers as sort of an underlying level there. Um, but it's just whether they tolerate them or how severe they get. But yeah, whether they're just subclinical. <laughs> yes, exactly. But the, but there is definitely an advantage that when you feed these fibre feeds from lots of the, the endoscopic work that's been done, that it's, it certainly reduces it and it certainly dampens it down. And the advantage of the fibre, of course, is particularly for the racehorses now. And incidentally, racing owners are much better now at feeding fibre. They're getting better. But uh, many of them will have taken on board, even giving a a, 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 a Lucy brick or whatever they call them, you know, fibre brick before they take them out. So it's only a small amount of fibre, but it yes. sits at the top of the stomach and just helps prevent some of the acid splashing. Yeah, it helps that um, layering and stratification exactly. of the stomach. Yeah, contents. but if you're if you're underlying feeding fibre, then you're also going to have a, um, just a, a better pH within within that, and you're not going to have an empty stomach. One of the problems with with meal feeding cereals is that it's quite dry because they eat it quickly. So you've got this lump of feed that sits in the stomach and then the stomach starts to empty at a certain time and out it goes and there's nothing left because it's not being trickled in. So that's when the acid can get going as well. So there's it, it, the, the whole sort of concept of feeding, continually keep feeding fiber is, is much better from just the fiber angle of how much fiber is going in there, but the whole trickle feeding aspect and the whole physiology and behavior of eating fiber. Yes, I, th I think it's, um, there, is, there is a statistic that says that ponies can um, have their whole dietary requirement from grazing for four hours. So they're such yes. efficient grazers. And I think that's yeah. quite sort of shocking to people to think that they, yes. they're probably thinking they need to give the pony more hay when it comes in. Yeah. Um, and well, we, we did we did a trial in Aberystwyth a few years ago, or many years ago now, and and um, we, we were restricting in, um, uh, intake and our restricting grazing time. And in three hours, ponies would eat more 
than their counterparts who were out for 12 hours because they sort of got into the habit of knowing that they were only there. So they put their heads down and they just mowed. And the amount that they could take in was shocking. Yeah, that's really interesting. Really mm. interesting. And, um, and the hay gain slow feeder, I think that's a great design because I'm always encouraging owners to feed from the ground. But a lot of horses are really messy and they'll just waste the hay or trample into it. But that's um, a great design. Is it simple, but um, a great concept? Yes, yes, and, and we're we're trying trialing the new um, the new model of it at the, at, at the moment, and it's um, but it's it's one of those things that's a little bit difficult to make it make work so that it's efficient and easy for people to use so that they will use it, but that will work and be robust enough for horses. So um, yes, the, the first couple of models that we tried, I um, I had a big seventeen hand dressage horse and he loved his hay. And he could dismantle one of those units very quickly. So he, he was a very good one to, to, uh, to test it. He just helped um, himself, uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, we're getting there, definitely getting there. Yeah, it'd be really nice to help promote that, but promote awareness of them, because I think that's yes. it yeah, yeah. really, really great concept. Um, and, and interesting, you mentioned, um, obviously we're always saying, oh yeah, soak the um, hay for laminated ponies to get rid of the soluble sugars. And... Um, the fact that that increases the bacterial load and you suggested with some horses that you steam and soak that's something I've never considered but actually it's a really good idea to do both yeah I mean what what we suggest is that you soak first and then steam because then because you've got to kill the bacteria yeah, the bacteria that you've yeah. created in the, um, in the soaking process so that I mean that that does that gets rid of that goes, gets rid of that problem I mean you still obviously leach the nutrients um, and you might want to leach the water soluble carbohydrates but um, but the, the one caveat I would put with all of that though is that there's a number of studies that we've published looking at water soluble carbohydrate leaching and at the moment you we can't we can't predict how much is lost according to hay type or stage of growth and so really if you've got a serious laminitic, you need to soak the hay that you have and then get it tested to see how much you are losing. And then if it's OK, feed it or you might need to get a different hay because some hays do seem to hold on to the WSC, even if they're soaked for, for longer periods. So I, I can't I can never recommend to say to somebody, well, no, you need to soak your hay for three hours because I because it depends on the hay, you know. Yeah, that's really interesting to sort of, and again, I haven't thought about analysing after you've soaked to see what you're actually left with. Yeah, um, yeah. And so I've got a question here, which is, um, is there a slow feeder muzzle that works for ponies um, out at pasture? Or is there a slow feeder muzzle ponies that, that works well that you could... You could um, yes, I mean, Annette Longland has done some work on that and um, she's found that muzzles, uh, um, some of the muzzles do do work well. I mean, I, I don't know off the top of my head what, what brand it would, it would be, but yes, muzzles are, um, are quite effective with ponies. Um, and lots of people think that oh, it's not fair on the animal, but it's, he's, it's better being out and interacting with it and being able to sort of move around. Um, and, and, and believe you me, an, an attack of laminitis is an awful lot worse than not being able to eat for a few hours. So, um, yeah, I, I think um, muzzles are very effective. Yes. Yeah, it does surprise me how well tolerated they are generally. Mm. So yeah. um, and yeah. seem to be people a lot more au fait with them now than they used to be. And yes, um, yeah, yeah. I, th I think that, that, that they use more frequently. And I thought another really pertinent point was about the rugging of horses and that affects their energy requirement and obesity. And as you say, we're all tempted to treat them as if we treat ourselves and to over rug and yes. um and that makes a huge difference if we if we didn't get drawn into the whole sort of marketing side of of rugging horses would would affect their energy use significantly and i think because we're trying to address obesity i think that's something that we should um really focus on but i thought you made a really good point as well about the fact that nutrition is often at the bottom of the list when for example vets are going out and they're looking at the lameness and they might say okay well horse needs to lose a bit of weight because there's more wear and tear on the joints but actually they're not focusing on making a pro a nutritional program but we get great nutritional support from the feed companies which is fantastic so i'd often recommend people um contact feed companies directly but um uh, as well as giving some advice but i do i do agree with you that we sometimes miss miss out sort of an, an area where we could be helping that horse more um potentially yeah yeah there's a great saying that says the eye of the feeder doth make the horse fat. And that's also very, very true. And, um, I, and this is why I would encourage people to, uh, to objectively do it. I mean, you can get programs or, or um, uh, 
videos now on the internet which shows you how to condition score. And, um, and I used to actually do it with my own horse because you see it every day and you don't notice what's happening. And if you go in and you lay your hands over the, over the, the, um, the, the tuber ishi, you lay it over the tuber cox, you look at the, feel the ribs, you feel the base of the neck, and you actually think, does this feel any different? It doesn't matter to some extent what score you give it, but what matters is, is it any different from last week? And yes. Can you actually feel the ribs? Can you actually feel those those the points of hips, etc.? Because um, if you can't, you know, you stand and look at it. It's not the same as laying your hands on. So I would encourage everybody to do that. Thank you, lovely. I, well, we don't have any more questions, so that just leaves me to thank you again, Mariel. Really okay. appreciate you joining us this evening, and um, yeah, lots of interesting take home information for everybody. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, you're welcome.